Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 74 of the Watch Rolling Podcast. The Watch Rolling Podcast is a veteran-owned podcast that focuses on horology from a veteran's point of view, as well as sharing valuable veteran resources with the watch enthusiast community. My name is Jason. I'm your host. If you're new to the pod, welcome. And if you're returning, welcome back. Uh, the podcast is brought to you by the Anti-Watch Watch Club. The Anti-Watch Watch Club is a 501c3 charitable organization that utilizes a drop-style culture to fund all kinds of military, law enforcement, veteran, and first responder charities through a wide variety of uh, just meeting people's needs, whether it's emotional, you know, financial, stuff like that. They do all kinds of great stuff, and they use a pretty cool system of, you know, all kinds of cool drop stuff. So you're talking sweatshirts, T-shirts, challenge coins, knowledge bottles, some of my personal favorites, lots of cool stuff, flags, and like, and they don't draw a salary doing it. It's a 501c3 charitable organization, so all profits go to the actual charities that they're supporting. So I invite you to check them out over at antiwatchclub.org. And then <clears throat> the podcast is also brought to you by Mushi Watch Traps. Mushi Watch Traps is a veteran-owned strap company uh, by an Air Force veteran, and they produce all kinds of fairly priced uh, nylon straps, watch rolls, you name it, um, two-piece canvas straps, the whole nine. I invite you to check out their canvas watch rolls. They're about 29 bucks, and the price might change by time of recording, but they're excellent. Four pockets, suede line. You can put all your stuff in them. I use them for tools. I use them for bringing watches when I travel on short trips and kinds of stuff. It's great stuff. So check them out, mushiwatchstraps.com, and use the code VET10 for 10% off your entire order um, over at the website. So today's topic, uh, before we start, actually, do a wrist check. I'm wearing my Tudor Ranger on the Uncle Straps Jubilee. Pretty snazzy. I like it. Nice and comfortable. Uh, I like the Tudor Ranger because it shows you what a, you know, for a larger wrist person, what a, what a smaller watch can do. It's really nice. It's comfortable. Oh, man, the thing's great. Anyways, and Uncle Straps did a great job with the bracelet. Fits like a charm. So today's topic is something, it kind of piggybacks off last week's episode where I just feel like the term dive watch, it's used really loosely. It's, it's like, we always joke around like hot and fast. Well, I mean, everyone's calling something a dive watch, right? And so for those of you that aren't familiar, there is an actual standard for a dive watch. Now, the ISO, the International Standard Organization, uh, that's paraphrasing it, but ISO they have standards for all kinds of stuff, right? So I'm not going to get into the history of ISO. I'll give you a brief history. Like post-World War II, this organization was founded and they developed standards. They're out of Switzerland. And basically, if so if anyone's ever been involved in like contract work or something like that, you have ISO 9001 companies, right? And it's just a laundry list of stuff that you do. And, you know, most of it's been proven to make you an effective business. But if you meet these steps and criteria, they can come and give you an ISO ISO 9001 certification, right? And you can say you're an ISO 9001 company, which means you follow this established set of criteria of these standards. And um, anyone that's going to do business with you will be like, okay, cool. This company does this, blah, 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 blah. We know at the bare minimum, they're going to follow these things. And it allows, you know, companies to work together and have a a semblance of faith that the the other company is acting within these standards and pretty much operating a smooth business. Now that's really paraphrased, right? Now the thing with the ISO standards are they're not free. So to obtain an ISO standard, you got to pay for it. And then, you know, you have to continuously show that you're keeping up on stuff, you know, like kind of like an OJT thing. I'm really paraphrasing a lot of this because you're not here for an ISO, um, overall ISO podcast. You're here for a watch podcast. But for those of you that are familiar, or maybe you're not familiar, there is an actual ISO criteria or standard for dive watches. And it's the 6425, right? That's the one everyone likes to quote. And there's all different kinds of stuff. But what I've noticed is, is that the term, and I never thought about it to the other day with the Braemont stuff, right? The super, super Marine is that people just call stuff dive watches and literally they're not by organizational or standard definition, right? Um, and there's all kinds of little stuff we can get into later, but it's, it's, if you're looking at the actual standard and the criteria in the standard, then they're not a dive watch per the standard. Now, the question is for you, the viewer does that standard seal the stamp of approval for a dive watch? Or are you cool with something that meets most of the criteria, but hasn't been through the actual standard process, right? They haven't been through the verification to be ISO 6425 certified, right? Because I've heard, I've heard, and I've, you know, I've read some stuff where some companies are like, we do everything, but we don't actually, you know, go get certified by the criteria. So the question of this podcast is for you, does it matter? Right? So, you as the watch enthusiast, um, does it matter if the 
if a watch is IS, if a dive watch, quote unquote, is ISO 6425 certified or not, right? And should a watch be allowed to be called a dive watch if it isn't? Because there's a lot of traditional criteria for dive watches. It's been established over decades, right? We talk about the story of, and you can argue it, whether it's, whether it's Long Pond, Rolex, you know, Zodiac, whoever you want, they, they can all fight it out about who was the first one. But there's, you know, decades and deeply rooted history in this horology for the Space 4 dive watches, right? And they're usually characterized by their ability, you know, to withstand water pressure. They usually have a unidirectional bezel for tracking elapsed time. And you got to be able to read them underwater, right? That's the stuff that people always know. And the big issue with the Braemont Supermarine last week was the, the one thing I heard was people were like, well, it doesn't have a tracking elapsed time bezel, right? And, you know, I was like, cool. You know, I, I understand. I understand the people's problem with that, right? Because, well, I mean, technically that's what a dive watch has got to have, but they never, Raymond never like said, oh, this is ISO 6425 certified. So I would say then why call it a dive watch, right? But the question for you is, does the horological history of what a dive watch is matter more than this ISO certification, right? Because there's been quote unquote dive watches long before the establishment of ISO 6425. So we've, we've established that, you know, historically there's been dive watches long before this ISO. Uh, and the, I'll tell you some funny stuff about the ISO in a second, but long before that there's been dive watches, right? So does the establishment of ISO 6425 actually negate anything before it that was called a dive watch? Me personally, I don't, I, I, I'll give you my answer at the end, but me personally, Mm, it's questionable, right? So what is the ISO 6425 and why is it a big deal? Well, it's an international standard and what they, what they're trying to do is establish a benchmark, right? A universal benchmark across the board. So wherever you go in the world, if you have this, if you have this ISO 6425 standard watch timepiece, you know, it's going to meet a certain set of criteria based off test, right? Now the military person in me appreciates that. Because if you've ever been in the military for more than five minutes, you know, when it comes to certain things, there are established procedures and standards that you have to meet, right? So technically you could go 4,000 miles away, 5,000, 8, 12,000 miles away, and someone's going to be doing maintenance on something theoretically almost the exact same if it's the same piece of equipment. Um, you know, you're not going to go to a store and find like, you know, totally different uniforms. There's, you know, there's a reason why uh, we have the standardization. And it is a universal um, I would say international for the unit or, you know, the organization as a whole, you know, it's not the same internationally for like France and like Germany, but if you're in the U S Navy, for example, and you are stationed in, you know, Washington state one day and the next day you're stationed in Italy, you know, technically when you go to the exchange to get some uniforms, you're getting the same uniforms, right? It's not going to be a bunch of, you know, mishmash of stuff all over the place, but the standard will you know, theoretically ensure a consistent level of quality, reliability, and safety. And the ISO outlines specific specifications and they cover the gamut, like water resistance, minimum, unidirectional you know, bezel, which we talked about, loom requirements, and a whole lot more. So if you meet all these requirements, you get a certification that attests to the suitability of these watches for diving, right? And we're talking like scuba diving, right? There's even criteria in there for saturation diving, but they talk scuba and saturation. I, I purchased the ISO 6425 document from the ISO website. I would love to share it with you, but I can't because you're not allowed to. There's like NDA stuff in there, right? I wish I could. Now, I'm almost positive those documents leak out, right? I mean, they're password protected and stuff, but you know how it is. I mean, you can go to some some websites, some some watch companies' websites that do the ISO basically outline it there for you. But, you know, I purchased it myself with, uh, with my own money because I really wanted to have a, the standard and B, you never know, man, well, yeah, I'll make a watch and like it'd be ISO 6425 certified. That'd be kind of cool. Um, but there's, there's eight unique tests they got to do. And like I said, I'm not going to run it down, but I, I, I'm not going to run it down like to a nat, you know what, but I'm going to outline it for you. So you kind of have an understanding of what actually happens in ISO 6425 certification process, right? So the first test is for visibility. And that's the, that's one thing that everyone always says that a dive watch has to be visible. Right. And, and I agree. I mean, you're in the water 90% of the time it's dark. Like if you've never been underwater do the light based on, especially where you are, the light does not penetrate as far down as you think it does. Right. Um, especially if you're out here in Hampton roads and you're going like shout out Brock from 
a deep sea EDC. Like I had Brock dives all the time in, in the Harbor. And I'm like, Oh man, it's, 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 it's clay, dirty, um, na- nasty water. And, uh, visibility is very important. There's magnetic resistance properties, right? We talk about that. That's always important, right? Because you know, you can, your watch gets magnetized. It gets all jacked up. It's not keeping perfect time. Um, and that could affect how long you're down in the water and, and where you know you are time-wise, right? So that could be dangerous. Temperature cycling, we've talked about how, you know, too hot or too cold can affect a watch. There's a salt spray test with the bracelet, right? Because they want to make sure the bracelet actually operates. Like the last thing you would want to do is um, have that thing lock up or have it rust or have it break and have the watch fall off. And all of a sudden, you don't know where the heck you, how much time you are. You know, I think in in a realistic scenario, they would just start, you know, trying to get out of the water and doing it at different depths like they're going to based on how far down they are. But, you know, there's also something about longevity, right? Because like if an organization's buying these watches and the bracelet doesn't withstand salt water, which if you've never been around salt water, it's just a fight against rust. I mean, um, the ocean wants to destroy that ship or that steel, whatever it is, right? So you got to have some kind of, you know, resistance to salt spray and be able to, you know, everyone knows you can rinse them off fresh water, but still isn't the point. Um, shock resistance property, right? On the watch head specifically is what it calls for. So, you know, you have to know that watch is going to have specific shock criteria. So if it gets banged up and I'm here to tell you like industrial diving, the stuff that, you know, civilian industrial divers do, the stuff that military divers do, a lot of tools next to a lot of metal next to, you know, pylons, piers, like heavy wood, um, big head fish. I've heard some stories. Um, you need, you need a shock resistant watch head because the last thing you want to do is, you know, get it knocked around and then have it messed up water resistance. Obviously we talk about that, uh, shock resistance properties, you know, for free fall. So there's difference like shock to the watch head and then shock resistance, like you drop the watch. Right. And then a resistance of attachments. So those are the seven criteria. And like I said, I'm not going to go like, I gotta be real careful. I don't want to like give away the criteria and then get a nasty email or something saying, Hey, you shouldn't be talking about, but. I'm just outlining the, the eight steps there and in, in what gets tested. So, so it doesn't mean a watch company can't do this on their own, but it's kind of like showing up to school and taking a test, but you don't go to the school, right? You're not registered. No one cares. You can pass a test, but it's not going to count for anything. It's just, uh, you can say you did it. And then really the only way to validate you did it is to take your word for it. Right. Which doesn't really amount to much. So those are the eight ones. Visibility, magnetic resistance properties, temperature cycling, salt spray test with the bracelet, shock resistance properties to the watch head, water resistance, shock resistance properties from a free fall, and then resistance of attachments. So now this comes down to you, right? To you, the watch enthusiast. What matters? I mean, this whole debate centers on, you know, do you respect tradition versus embracing standardized benchmarks, right? Now I can say for me, it's weird. It's a weird place. I'm the military, but I don't dive. I mean, I might one day, but I'm not going to like, I mean, come on, man. Like I'm not going to be super duper Joe diver, right? It's just not, it's not something I, I, I think it's cool, but it's not something I'm keen on doing. So for me, I don't care if it doesn't have a, a marker every five minutes on the dial for an analog watch, right? Like they're supposed to. So technically my Shogun, not ISO 6425 certified. Um, I've, I've seen stuff written where the Rol- where Rolex is with the date aren't, right? But then again, they don't go around saying that they are. And so do you, on one side, take the, the history and the heritage and that's what really matters? And for you, that's a dive watch? Or are you taking the standard and certification and taking that as gospel for what is a dive watch, right? And I think how fast and loose this term has been played with has caused some watch companies, some problems because some people get up in arms. Now I'm going to tell you for me, I'm not up in arms because I'm a, I'm a desk diver, you know, fully certified, man. You know, like I, I got all the paperwork. I can pull it up and show you one day. I'm one of the best desk divers in the history of the planet. And, um, I don't care, but I could see that if you were a person who, you know, dove regularly, whether it was for recreation, but you're scuba diving. Um, some of that stuff gets hairy, you know what I mean? Because it's like, I think it's like any other hobby that you do. Once you, you know, once you get to a certain level, you want to 
do it a little bit better or a little bit cooler, right? Quote unquote. And, you know, you, you graduate from, you know, maybe being 25, 50 feet down to, I don't know, going a hundred feet down, maybe diving shipwrecks. I've heard crazy stuff about that. You know, I know like diving caves is really different and much more dangerous. And, you know, you could ratchet up like anything. Like you can, you can, I don't know, go buy a freaking uh, Nissan Skyline, or you can buy, you know, the new Porsche Taycan or whatever I was pronounced. There's different levels to that kind of stuff, right? So I think it just comes down to personal choice, really. Like for me, for me, honestly, it's it's heritage and design, and I like having a little bit of history on my on my wrist, right? I, I've, I've said it before. I feel like I've made history in my own way. I've been involved with some cool stuff, not necessarily in diving, but from my military background. So I'm cool with that. I don't necessarily, like, I've told people this before. I've been scared for real, like for real scared. I don't really want to do that anymore if I don't have to. I'm not going to go seek it out if I don't have to. But I think that if you are, if, uh, if, if that kind of adventure is what you're doing and it involves diving, then I can see where the 6425 certification matters, right? And and I think like most collectors, you might that might point you might have a collection of dive watches that some are ISO certified and some aren't. And you use the ones that you know, maybe use the ones that are ISO 6425 certified for your more serious stuff that you're going to do. And you use the other ones just to have a little piece of heritage and and to have some history on your wrist because if you are super into diving, it's like anything else, right? Like people collect stuff and that's the whole point. You know, that's why we're doing this thing, right? It's to have, it's to have that cool stuff. So if you're super into diving, you know what I mean? Like you might have a whole plethora of dive watches. You might just have one or two really special ones, but I think it just comes down for you as the guest, you know, what really matters to you. So I just don't understand. It'd be like me, a desk diver, really complaining that Braymont's Supermarine didn't have the appropriate bezel on it. Because to me, it doesn't matter. To me, it's just a cool watch. And to reiterate what I said last time, I think that they just need to determine, like come up with some new terms for these watches that aren't ISO 6425 adjacent, I guess. Um, I think it would just solve them a lot of problems. But, you know, in closing, like, I think the debate over whether watches meet this standard or not revolves around what some people can consider tradition versus adhering to standardized benchmarks. And like I said, not everybody does that. And I think especially for us military folk, it's really, we forget that the world does not operate that way. We operate that way. And if you've like done it for 20 years, like me, you get used to like breakfast at a certain time, you know, like lunch at a certain time, work hours, you know, uh, work standards, the way you do things. Sometimes you're doing something, you know, like maintenance, you're doing something the same way, the same time, a thousand times. And you're not allowed to deviate from that or anything like that. Right. Because you can get someone killed or you can damage equipment, which usually ends up getting someone killed. And so it's important for us to remember the rest of the world does not operate that way. They just don't. So for some people, the ISO 6425 isn't going to matter. Because it's not it's not the world they they grew up in. It's not the world they learned to to quote unquote dive in, right? And I'm pretty sure there's like some dive schools that are super serious about it, and some that aren't so super serious about it. So I think it's just important for us as collectors to consider both sets of criteria and, and just weigh ultimately what matters to you the most. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this down in the down in the comment section or the towel thread, whatever they want to call it. Like put some put some put some thoughts down in the comment section. I'd love to hear about it because. You know, there might be a reason why as a desk diver, you want to be super serious about it. I don't know. You might be a super serious diver and not be super serious about it. I'd like to know that too. So until then, you know, happy, happy hunting, diving, whatever you want to do with your watch. Um, next episode is going to be pretty cool. I'm going to do a special Thanksgiving day episode. It's going to release on Thanksgiving. I fully don't expect you to watch it on Thanksgiving. I hope you're having some turkey, but it'll be there for you after you wake up from your uh, tryptophan nap. And, um, like I said, feel free to leave some comments in the, in the show notes and, uh, let us, you know, let me know what you think about it. I'd love to know your opinion. Does the ISO 6425 matter to you? Does it not? Should it matter more? And should watch companies kind of like really think about what they're doing? 
when they name or when they say something or use a term for something, right? And one other thing, I want to shout out to my boy Alex. We know you're out there doing good stuff. Uh, wherever you're at, parts unknown. Uh, can't wait to hear from you. Hope everything's going well. Hope you're getting some good wrist shots, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. And for everyone at home, remember at watchrolling.com, you make the watch. The watch doesn't make you.